This is Craig, and I just want to say Happy New Year to everyone, and welcome to another year of Asset Horizon. This should be a big year for us, as I am committed to being a full-time producer for this program, and the podcast will be teaming up with Zero Books to put out videos, podcasts, interviews, and other content throughout the year. What makes this possible is your support. That means either becoming a patron, or checking out our merch store, or even simply just joining us on social media, retweeting episodes, and sharing what we do with other people. We have great episodes on the way on the topics of destituent communism. Also, we have an episode of Inner Experience coming up on the topics of grief, suffering, and shame. Today, we will be talking with Tyreek, who is a philosophy student, and together we will share stories, the trials and travails of being an academic philosopher. So let's get started. Welcome to Acid Horizon, the theory podcast. Today's a special episode. It is a nod to our followers on Twitter. And I have successfully extracted one of those <laughs> followers in the form of Tyreek, who is an excellent philosophy poster, posts a lot of great how, how can we say just pages of book just marked up with copious <laughs> annotations, not to mention his interests align very closely with ours here on the podcast. And I, I for a long time, wanted to do an episode on just the, the, the sort of holistic experience of being a student, either as an undergrad or a graduate student or an undergrad on the way to being a graduate student. And then in a PhD program, all of us just kind of getting in there, a big mishmash of all of our experiences. Welcome to the show, Tyreek. How are you doing today? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. I've been watching you guys for a while um, and I've been having a good time watching, learning a lot. So I'm excited to be on. When I noticed you on Twitter, it was apparent to me that you were someone who's working very intentionally towards a long-term career, either in philosophy or somewhere else in academia. So maybe you can just start off by talking to us about your origin story, as it were. How did you get into philosophy, and what were the things that actually led you to consider a potential career in academia? Yeah, I always like talking about this because it always kind of reminds me of comic books and nerdy stuff. <laughs> so I guess my philosophy origin story my philosophy origin story starts in high school, actually, which is, from what I understand, rare for most people my age. So I started in high school. I was taking an AP language and composition class in my 11th grade year. And, you know, we were, I forgot, we were reading through a lot of different books in that class. We read, you know, Malcolm X's autobiography in there. And, you know, we were kind of just weaving through different stuff talking about politics and you know how it relates to writing and language and I thought it was it was really interesting it was really intriguing so somehow I don't remember how but somehow we ended up getting to Plato an allegory of the cave and we read that in the class and I was really 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 intrigued the teacher was like he's not like he wasn't really trained in philosophy or anything but he's like this is an AP class and we want to simulate it, make you feel like a college course and in college classes, they'll throw anything at you really. So, you know, he threw that at us and he's like, you know, try to see what you can get out of it. And I, I got a lot out of it. I thought the text was really interesting. It was the first time I read something and I kind of felt like I was really turning the pages. Um, Cause for the longest I've, I haven't like, until I got into philosophy, I wasn't really the biggest bookworm. Just reading that, I was really, really intrigued and I wanted more. And I knew that my senior year, we would have a full on philosophy class. So the story continues. And there, my philosophy class, my senior year of high school was really interesting. We basically divided the course up to epistemology, metaphysics and ethics at the end of the year. So we started with some kind of basic what is philosophy kind of stuff to like get the wheels turning. We reread the allegory of the cave and we read some stuff from Baldwin and um, some stuff from like, you know, contemporary people working in it right now, like grad students. And then when we moved into philosophy, we covered a, like when we moved into like the topics like epistemology, we covered a wide range of stuff. Like, um, you know, we started with Descartes and then we moved into Hume and then into Kant, like one page, just one page of Kant. Cause like, you don't want to throw like a lot at like, you know, high schoolers. We did one page of Kant. Um, and then 
we then moved into like the truth and power interview with Foucault, which is oh, like cool. one of my favorite oh, yeah. uh, texts. Like I, I love that text a lot. We moved into that and then we did some stuff with uh, analytic epistemology, particularly uh, black feminist epistemology. Who did we look at? Dotson. Christine Dotson, I think is her name. Yeah. We looked at her work. I loved it. When we did metaphysics, we looked at a wide range of stuff there too. James, uh, Aquinas, m- most of it like on question of God, if God exists, his free will exists. Patricia Churchland, ethics, we did Confucius. We even did like Cornell West, like all over the place, which I, I thought was really great. And um, this is just high school. Yes. Yes. So like I get, I get to the, I get like a really good, I get a, a, a high school, at a high school level, I get like a deep dive almost into philosophy. Um, and, you know, like, obviously it's not like, you know, we're not like writing any like big papers or anything or digging into the text the way we do in like college class, but like to just kind of get familiar with names and faces and, you know, work and ideas I thought was, you know, amazing. And the stuff we were doing in there were some of the, some of my favorite and fondest memories. I mean, in my high school, and this is a long time ago, the AP kids, they had copies of Plato's The Republic. Yeah. And I don't think the normies were allowed to touch them at all. And I don't think I learned a single lick of philosophy. With that said, then you went to your undergrad program. Now, would you say that your undergrad program has delivered the goods in terms of fulfilling the promise of what philosophy could bring to your life? Or like maybe just talk about what you thought the, the highs and lows of that were. So when I finished my like senior year, with uh, philosophy and like after kind of like being super in love with it, I knew that somehow I was going to bump into this again. Right. And I originally, when I started my senior year, um, before I kind of developed the relationship that I did with philosophy, I was kind of going to go to college for education. Okay. To be a, um, to do like secondary education. Um, and, you know, I took, uh, so I, I, that's what I started with originally. I was originally an education major, um, double major in English, and I tried to minor in philosophy. And I I remember taking, like, the ed psych courses, which is kind of what you start with in, in that major. You start with, like, educational psychology. And I just remember just doing it and just kind of, like, wanting to go to my philosophy class <laughs> mm-hmm. um, right. and, you know, and that's, that's not, that's not like anything that, you know, education is a really important field, but I just knew that that is not where I wanted to be. So I ended up running back there or ended up running back to philosophy. I dropped my education major, became an English, English minor philosophy major. Um, and I will say that, I will say that, uh, I will say if I hadn't take, if I hadn't taken um, the amount of philosophy that I did in, uh, high school, like the, if I didn't get exposed to it, my first class might have not sold me. Oh, interesting. Um, okay. So my first class, and it's 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 not really more. That's not really. I wouldn't say it's put it's blame I put on the university or anything, but um, my first class was taught to me by an adjunct, and you know those can those that can go either way, and that's you know again that's nothing on them either because I know what the field looks like. Um, so. We, we did, we did philosophy in that class, but I felt we didn't do any, um, primary sources. We didn't read any primary sources. We had a book called the 13 theories of human nature. Um, and it was kind of just like summaries of, uh, of thinkers instead of like a proper survey course. And I had already got exposed to a lot of stuff we were doing in there. So it was kind of like, I was already kind of super interested but like I know if I hadn't already been exposed, I'd have been bored, um, you know, because mm. we weren't really working with the ideas or working with the stuff um, primarily. It wasn't really until, um, you know, my second semester where I did my logic class uh, mm. of all classes. My logic class was taught to me by uh, a pragmatist, different pragmatist than what I was talking about earlier, a pragmatist adjunct philosopher. And it was great. It was really great. And usually, you know, like logic is usually the one. This is all usually the class that us are, us philosophers are usually like, no, you don't want to do that. But I, I, I actually ended, ended up really liking it. We read some good stuff and it got me hype into my sophomore year, which is where I would say I got like the most out of the major so far. Here's something that I, I often think about with respect to uh, philosophy students getting more involved or, or becoming passionate about philosophy is that typically there's a, a teacher 
or a professor mm -hmm. or some figure. I, I mean, maybe it's somebody in the books, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But maybe it's also somebody in our life at that time who motivates you, maybe because they're a good model of an academic philosopher. Maybe they're just a good human being. Is there somebody within your undergrad experience or your high school experience who did that? And if, yeah. if, if that's the case, what was it about them that that made them a good model? So I would say there are definitely, so my high school experience, obviously, I think my, uh, my philosophy teacher who taught us all the stuff I was talking about before made it a very welcoming space, which I know um, based off conversations I've had with others and even kind of just like just Twitter experiences, I know can be different from what philosophy yeah. can be like, you know. <laughs> The opposite. It's a very of, generous term. Yeah, you know, like you, not not very welcoming. Um, and I and I and I would kind of expect that since seeing that we're like seniors in high school, you want to make stuff like this kind of like digestible. But even just outside of that, like I would I could talk to her about questions. I remember you know asking her for papers on stuff that we hadn't covered in class. Like I was interested in like um, Stoic stuff because we were. Um, working through Plato and we're working through Aristotle. And um, I bumped into uh, Stoic stuff on my own, like kind of like research or whatever. And I was interested to find out what, you know, that looks like or who are some figures I should read. And she, I remember her giving me like copies of stuff to read and whatnot. And I thought that that was really, really, really um, welcoming. And I, I kind of cherished a lot of that. And that kind of helped me kind of realize that, you know, this is this can be a space potentially where, you know, we're helping people learn um, and we're helping people who are interested in things learn about these big ideas. And then when I got to when I got to undergrad, I would say that almost all of my professors have been that way as well. Um, there are two standout cases. I have one professor who I've had since I was a freshman, but it wasn't in a philosophy class. It was in a um, one of those uh, first year seminar courses where you take um, that are kind of like super interdisciplinary. Um I remember taking his class and I loved it. Um, like if that was my philosophy class, I definitely would have been sold <laughs> over the last one I was just telling you about. And, you know, he's, he's been a great professor and a great mentor since that class. Um, and then just recently last semester, I've developed a relationship with another um, professor and she's been wonderful this summer. Hopefully we're going to be working on writing samples and, letters of recommendation and you know, personal statements and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, yeah, like people like that have kind of popped in to help out and I've enjoyed it. It is like so important to undergrads to find it. If there is a professor who you have that relationship with and graduate school is something you're considering, it is so important to flag that to them because they will be such a helpful resource for letters of rec for editing your your writing sample because who knows your writing sample better than the person you wrote it for so this idea that like you can just take this 20 page 30 page paper and just make it work for a committee because you just know what's it it's silly right especially when we're writing hyper specific papers um, so I'm like, I'm going through that process again, as I apply out of the MA and into PhD programs. So yeah, it's, it's great that you, that you made that connection. Yeah. And I, I knew when I met the, the first mentor that I was telling you about, when I met him and I told him some of the interest that I had, particularly with like existentialism and continental philosophy, more contemporary stuff, he immediately was like, you want to meet with this person, right? And and I know that that's not something that most students have um, because there are a lot of department politics that mar the experiences for students, which I think can really suck. So some that, that you know, people's professors prides get in the way and they won't kind of like push students in the right directions. But I told him, you know, I was interested in the philosophy thing. I, I had just dropped education. I'm trying to do this all the way. One of the things that I appreciated at the time too is, was that, they were honest with me with one, the, you know, obviously with how the market looks and how the profession looks uh, these days, how challenging and difficult it is, but also being encouraging at the same time, which I think is detrimental personally, like whether or not you can do both of those things well um, is going to affect a lot of students' future. I've met a fair share of students at LaSalle and like elsewhere 
who are who have been interested but dropped their interest because they didn't get any real like motivation or push from their professors and it's tough it is tough because i know uh what the scene looks like but i also think at the same time there there should be give and take as at the same time we're like we're kind of like encouraging students to say like yes things don't look good for us right now but like obviously we want we you know we need you know new ideas we need new people out there and if you think you can do it i'm going to do everything i can to help you get there uh, so i i appreciated that since being in my undergrad and slowly making my way out of there yeah i want to pick up on something you mentioned um earlier actually which i i've been thinking about as well over the last sort of year or so it was you mentioned that um that that first course that you did you know, you, you don't you don't actually read any of the the, the primary texts you get um you know, either a sort of textbook of some kind, which sort of guides you through it. I've been thinking about this because I had a similar experience an undergrad, uh, throughout my undergrad, which um, it, it wasn't normally textbooks. Normally what they do is they give you 10 pages from what Kant actually wrote. And then they'll give you like three papers, which are a little bit longer, you know, like more recent papers written about the thing that you could just be reading. And it's, it's really bizarre because I, I thought, you know, at like the end of my undergraduate degree, you can study Aristotle or virtue ethics, let's say, for like three years. But at no point will you be required to actually sit down and read Nicomachean Ethics front to back. And it, I was thinking about it again because I'm doing a PhD at the University of Leeds and I've got a friend there who's, um, he was born and raised in France. And it could be, in fairness, that he's overstating this to make England look worse, which is also fair because... Because it is. You know, <laughs> um, but he was saying like he did undergraduate philosophy in, in, in France and he said... Like the idea that you would be able to sort of get out of your degree without having read the phenomenology of spirits, all of Plato's major works and so on, like it, it, it just, it would be ridiculous. Right? And it's like, it's, there's this issue, I think of, maybe it's because of a hyper-specialization of academia now, but, um, and maybe it's because people, they want to make, to make, make it more accessible or something, um, which, which makes sense as well, I suppose, because frankly, asking someone to sit down and read, you know, all of the critique of pure yeah. reason or something is a hell of an ask. Um, but sometimes, sometimes the difficulty of the text is sort of part of what makes it valuable, because it's as you. As, I think it's sometimes it's as you struggle to understand what the hell this book is trying to say um, that you start to really, really understand it beyond being able to um, repeat what a what a journal article told you that Kant said. And so I, I had that, that sort of experience as well. And I, I, I don't know if, it, if it's helpful or unhelpful because, yeah, as, as I said, there, there can be inaccessibilities there. So updating what's what can be quite quite dry and old language in some ways and sort of putting it in a more accessible and, and easy to understand way. But also, yeah, some of the difficulty gets erased there, I think, of having to grapple with, you know, I think Mark Fisher talks about, you know, the, the difficulty of understanding Nietzsche is part of point of Nietzsche. Yeah, I would say like with that class in particular, it's, and I, I, I think it's probably one of the only classes where that was the case, where we didn't really read primary sources. One of the things that I always have to kind of remind myself too is that like, especially when it comes to like 100 level courses that, you know, these are kind of requirements for other students. But at the same time, I, I, I do think, you know, the essence of, uh, you know, doing the philosophy stuff should be there at the same, like should be in the, in the, in the courses. And I think back again at my high school experience where we did get the text and it was only a little, like, you know, it wasn't like the whole thing. Um, but we did get the text. We got to like, wrestle with it. And I think wrestling with it is what has allowed me to kind of like come out of it and be more interested in philosophy. When you start with this kind of like, um, you know, trying to take the easy route, if you will, you're going to get students who aren't interested. I'm happy that, you know, I haven't had to repeat that experience. Um, and I'm happy that that only was only a problem when I began. And yeah, I'm not sure. I think you know, I've also had the experience too that you said earlier about like you get the text and then you read the article that's recent. I feel like that can be that can be a little bit helpful and that can kind of in some ways kind of draw a bridge between students who might be really interested in what's going on and students who are might just be having to take the class because they have to. This past semester I took political and uh, social philosophy and we read, you know, Aquinas on property. So we did that, and that was really interesting. And then one of the one of the things that we had to write about, we had to read the stuff on property, and then we had to choose three different articles 
recent articles by current natural law theorists, like people who are working with Aquinas, and then draw connections between what we have from the original text and what we see happening in the current stuff. That I thought was really interesting because then you get like real contemporary political issues and you're connecting it to the original text. Perhaps that could kind of like balance things out because I think it is a tall order to ask undergrads to fit, like, unless you're like, unless you're someone like me, who's like going out of the way to do that. Like it's, it's a tall order, I think, to ask students to like read an entire like huge philosophy text on their own. And I don't think I'd have managed it personally, particularly because like the first like 17 years of my life, I wasn't stupid, but I was just utterly uninterested in anything going on, going on around me really. Um, I, I, basically got sort of switched on to philosophy and politics and things like right around the time I should have been thinking about like my A-levels and, you know, where to go after that. So, you know, some of these things are kind of necessary. I think Uh, they help people sort of get a foothold in what can otherwise be a very confusing sort of discipline. I mean, half the problem is sort of knowing where (laughs) to start even. Right. So. I think that there's this like broader tragic element though, and this is, true in in the Western Academy, where like one has to know precisely what one has a passion for by the time they are 17. That specialization must take place. Those like, because frankly, like I share a lot of those, those same, uh, that same developmental path um, with, uh, with Matt here. It's like at 17, you know, like, this the this idea that I, that I would be interested in like the history of madness <laughs> is absurd, <laughs> right? Like you know, the seventeen uh, year old will be like, "Who who is this bald man?" <laughs> that you're talking like, this is so strange. Yeah. Like so, in a certain sense, like I think it's so important that undergrad professors really make philosophy courses something that can engage a student who is not in the discipline. So a student who isn't the four of us or wasn't Craig, you know, like, because it's about tapping those passions that are directed towards other things and showing students that in fact, those same kinds of investments can be made here as well. And in fact, the stakes lie here, (laughs) you know, the, the stakes don't necessarily lie at these, these other places, but in fact, at these more fundamental questions um, about the nature of experience, uh, and so on. So like phenomenological ontological questions. So I think like a really, really good Plato professor, or I, th- I really do believe this, a really good existential philosophy professor can change your life. 100%. 100%. I mean, my, my professor who taught me like such and, uh, all that, you know, all the existential stuff, you know, she's had a gigantic impact, not only in like how I, like read and engage with philosophy, but also how I write, you know, how I think about things. And, you know, and it's primarily because, you know, she did exactly what you said, kind of like tried to attempted to kind of like point to all the things that are important and show why it is important. We unpack it here specifically. That's challenging, but I think that's the task of the academic. I mean, maintaining that interest for me has always been such a problem because at least in, in my introductory philosophy courses around sort of, I guess it was coming to be high school, yeah, sixth form, A-level kind of time. It was, there was two positions you could take with an uh, introduction to philosophy, which is always Plato. It was, one, everyone, how do you know this table's here? What do you know what a table is? And then the other half was, this Plato guy says, if you do philosophy, you can be a philosopher king and be smarter than everyone else and then defeat everyone in arguments. That was the two paths they gave people in my introductory <laughs> philosophy class. Either you became a totalitarian dictator, or you was an idiot who stared at a similar time thinking about what the table he was he was whacking, or just writing on what his writing desk was. <laughs> yeah, yeah, naturally. <laughs> I, no, I, to be a debate, bro. <laughs> naturally. It was always geared towards debate, and luckily... I never fell into that into that sort of pit of of, of debate. Yeah. Uh, I would have I would never have got out of it. But the, yeah, like I did. Yeah, like Will did exactly. Like, but in, but it is that problem of maintaining interest because it's not saying okay, do you want to critique power? Do you want to understand in power? Do you want to understand how the world came to be as you see it and how your own senses reflect on the wider political constellations of your time? What is an ideology? What is the perfect city like? And why are we not living in it? And it's no, it started off with this 
what's a table? Or do you want to get out of the cave and go be Neo from the Matrix and, you know, show everyone else is, 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 less, is less intelligent than you are kind of thing? <laughs> it's interesting because I think about, like, if you watch anything that, like, like anything that Cornell does, uh, Cornell West, mm. whenever he does, like, interviews um, with, like, folks who might not be in the discipline. One of the things he always brings up is the, I think he always brings it up, is from uh, Dostoevsky, that, um, you know, the fundamental question is, do you want to be free, right? And most mm. people don't want to be free, right? And I think that's, like, the challenge that, like, philosophy professors are attempting to shake with uh, with students. And, mm. you know, that's the, that's, that's the primary dilemma. When I hear you kind of talk about, like, uh, you know, do we want to really critique power? Do we really want to do all these other things? Or, you know, do we kind of just want to keep things safe, yeah. understandable, digestible? Like, do we really want to, like, un- untangle that? And I think that's, it's a sh- I think it is a shame, right? That we don't take, like, most, most professors don't want to take up that challenge. Yeah, they don't teach you about how to get back down into the cave right. and then bring other people out. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you don't, I mean, they don't start off with, I mean, they could start off with that one thing from Spinoza, you know, you know we all want to be free, so why aren't we? Yeah. Why are people fighting in the opposite direction? Maybe they don't know they're going in that direction. And we could already be halfway across the line there, but it's. I think that's partially because the institution maybe is working against philosophy. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, they they just want featherless bipeds with diplomas <laughs> at the end of the day. Yeah, and here's the, the the thing too is that like the the state of philosophy departments is indicative of the of the state of philosophical inquiry. Like philosophy departments are just simply under attack. Like th- there is not a single program I can think of that I've interacted with where philosophy is not always in a state of existential threat. In in the face of other liberal arts programs too, that produce really good itinerant liberal uh, technocrats, and it's not as though those degrees aren't fascinating, that those professors aren't doing good work, but the reality is, is like philosophy shouldn't, and I really believe can't produce the technocrat. Like it's just not. Uh, intrinsic to its pedagogical function, whereas discourses like political science can often just lend to the production of like really good, you know, bureaucrats. And like that's not that's not to say don't you don't get those degrees. Like that's my undergrad degree. My undergrad degree is in political science. And it's what l- led me to pursue whatever I'm doing now, this hodgepodge of Foucauldian uh Agamben disability stuff, um, but like I, I recognize now the state that that these departments are are often in. Um, so, like, I think that the the problem is both at the level of of the classroom, but it's also like a much broader and frankly global problem with the state of philosophy as a practice. Um, and I think that if we can. Maybe start to navigate that. It's hard, but it's impossible to do that while you're also writing cover letters, right? And you're getting your CV ready. Because when you're in the trenches, uh, it's kind of hard to say, well, is this war really yeah. worth? Yeah. Like, yeah. Am I perpetuating All something right. I shouldn't be? Like, you well, know? well, here's a question. I'll, I'll have I'll direct it at Tyreek first, but maybe everybody can say something about it. And this was my experience as a grad student. Was uh, and, and I went to a commuter campus. I mean. It was a very rigorous program. It was actually highly ranked in its category of philosophy. But I went back to school. I went back to philosophy after almost 15 to 20 years of not doing philosophy academically. And the landscape completely changed. And one thing that I did on the regular as a grad student was if I wasn't writing a letter of support for a professor that I had, I was writing some kind of letter to defend the program. And it was almost as if we were enlisted ad hoc or as mercenaries to protect the university from these neoliberal forces, which were encroaching upon the ability of philosophy to do its thing. And, and, and us as the paying students were the ones who were at the front lines of it. And I'm, I'm curious if in your experience, and, and I don't want to out you, Tyreek, yeah, but yeah, like, is, is this something that you had to contend with? So, um, I mean, not anything that I can think, I'm trying to think if there's anything directly that I can think of that kind of 
sounds similar to that experience. I know that um, we, I, I obviously, I think one of the important things and one of the things that one of my professors mentioned to me is that what you see happening in universities is a kind of an interesting lesson on how superstructures work. Um, and particularly the kind of like neoliberal super, superstructure kind of changing how the, you know, university looks, right? And, you know, when you look at it, um, where I'm going, like at the point of which I'm going to college as an undergrad is the kind of point where like, we're kind of at like this big, I want to say like, well, perhaps not the big, but like almost at like a climactic point of neoliberalism, right? Where it has kind of like found its way in almost every space in our reality. Um, and of, of course the university doesn't escape that. So one of the things that my professor is telling me about is that before you guys were here, like for my like class and a few classes before us, you know, there wasn't this heavy emphasis on advertising, right? There wasn't this heavy emphasis on kind of like making your major something marketable or making yourself something marketable, teaching you how to do elevator pitches or, um, you know, orienting the, um, you know, the, the look of the, the school. I have a, one of my uh, professors that teaches aesthetics. This is something that she talks about a lot. Um, or anything to look around the school as something that kind of like looks appealing um, for a certain kind of person, right? Those are all things that are really new in in a way, right? Like they're they they're they're obviously not new because they've you know they they have been in other places, right? Like they were originally in the market, but like now that that stuff is kind of like like permeated itself everywhere, it looks new for the university, so. In my experience, I can't really think of anything where the students have had to organize anything um, except for before I came. So right before I came, there um, there was a big, there was like this big, um, there's this big thing that happened with the university, um, university's museum, right? Where our school sold um, museum materials. And I think most of us know as I kind of, art students and humanity students, that's a huge no-no, right? Like you, you don't do that. Um, so one of the things that the students took upon themselves to do, um, particularly the students of the philosophy club, uh, were was to kind of like organize and like one, kind of say why this is wrong, right? Like taking a stand with the faculty who also said it was wrong. Um, and I think if I'm not mistaken, again, this is before I was here, so... Um, I'm kind of iffy on the details, but uh, the club organizers had a showing of, um, you know, a documentary on what happens when you start to remove the arts or kind of like um, remove the arts or start to um, mess with the arts, if you will, um, for private gain, you know, for these kind of like neoliberal incentives, neoliberal um, kind of motives, what happens to um universities, what happens to places when that happens. I forget what exactly they watched, um, but that kind of stuff has happened at this, at, at where I'm at before, right? So like there is, you know, potential, obviously, I think for these kind of like big student pushbacks. Um, and I speak to one of my professors now who still talk about like um, nothing really changing until students uh, and not just faculty, students have like some type of like organized strike, uh, like some type of real organized movement. And, you know, it's not just one professor who mentions this. I've had other professors who've uh, talked about that as well. But yeah, I mean, as for myself, something that I can directly think of, uh, you know, what we do do, and I think this is the case for most places, what we do do is attempt to kind of like organize these efforts and make them end up working for the university. If there are these like, sentiments that students or even faculty might have there's a there's a way that the university attempts to kind of reorient it back to um the vision that they have which i agree does kill and you know hurt us like not just you know philosophy students but humanity students overall yeah it's as if the standards just being set lower and lower you know year after year yeah with Adam and and Matt here, does did this sort of thing happen in UK universities? So there was a there was a big strike recently across many many UK universities. The UCU University and College Union 
mainly to prevent uh, attacks on pensions or called general staff cuts. I mean, at my university, entire departments have just been completely axed. And um, I mean, students were coming. I, spe- I mean, I remember talking to people in um, students in my department, other master's students, and there was um, quite a few meetings on the subject of eventually coming the idea of consciousness raising between the students and the faculty. Because the one thing we're not really taught is what is a student and what is my place here? We're not taught that. We're just given, okay, here's, you need to go do this, do this form out, fill this paper in, read this for then. And you're in sort of in a constant state of immediacy of being given immediate objects to work on that you never really understand what a student is. You just know what a student does or ought to do if it knows what's good for it in some senses. The strike could be a great way to sort of interrupt that. And they say, look, okay, wait, why are we here? I so, say okay, immediately the strike is like, you know, it's a line that says you can't, you know, please don't cross this line or don't cross this line. And you just put some coffee on the side and say, okay, just why are we here in the first place, guys? Let's talk about this. And then like, you get to talk about the wider function of what the student does in that machine. And then you can start to connect the idea that some of the, the, the lecturer's teaching conditions are the same things as the student's learning conditions. So you can form mutual solidarity base. But at the same time, there's always that tension between a sort of a strike action uh, sort of on behalf of lecturers and staff where there's, you need to break through that barrier of, well, no, aren't, aren't we doing this for uh, the, the, the same teachers? Because there's a disconnect between the teachers as an institutional position and as fellow workers, fellow people who are working towards you with philosophy. And that separation really comes from, I mean, when you said, uh, Tariq, about the superstructure, that's, that was my experience doing a TA thing. So I just finished, I'm just rounding up doing a teaching assistant position. And when you start sort of marking essays and you do tutorials and you start sort of automatically thinking, well, I've been called to do this teaching thing. I need to mark. I need to be go on to the marking scheme. It's like, no, you don't. Stop being a dickhead to your students. You just, you encourage them when you can. It's like, why am I being hard? Because I'm, ex- I'm ex- expected of me. You need that sort of, that's why I think it's good for a, uh, Grad students get teaching experience, uh, especially when they have a grant, which means that they detach that need of the money, so you can't question it at all, at least a little bit, from the teaching itself. Because then you realise, well, wait, why am I grading so harshly? Because I expect grades to be harsh, because that's what teachers do. I mean, is uh, am I? You know, what sort of space am I creating? What part am I playing in this? It's about finding those little breaks between the institution. It, it may even render the institution kind of a mute point afterwards. But at least you can maintain that sort of sense. The institution of the university is great for material support. I mean, it's Moten and Harney call it a place of refuge. It's about finding those, yeah, those little undercommons, those points of contact where the real philosophy gets done, rather than trying to smooth the output of the machine that produces people as constant workers, eventually give them more and more tasks such that, I mean, this is why people drop out of philosophy quite a bit, because it's, you never, you're never yet doing philosophy. Yes, okay, you do one course, then you've got to read this book, then you've got to do an undergrad, then you do a master's, then you do a PhD, and then maybe you're a philosopher if someone hires you. And it's the institution itself, which is this sort of infinite deferral, calling you into places, are you a philosopher, yes or no? But they're controlling the sort of the subject pattern through and through. Yeah, I think, I think about it in, um, I think about something that my existential philosophy professor taught when we were looking at uh, we were reading Being in Nothingness and um, when we're talking about like exigencies, um, you know, these planes of action that kind of organize what experience is going to look like. And you know, one of the things she mentioned was that as students, you guys are engaged with this, right? Like there is a, there's a certain exigency that kind of discloses what actions are um, the right things to be doing right now. You're supposed to be studying, reading, this, that, and the third. And she's like, there's the same thing for us, right? And one of the things I like to do is kind of in the, thinking about that, right? Pairing it with the kind of superstructural stuff we're talking about is that, you know, most people, and again, this goes back to the question of, you know, can professors really shake that question of do students want to really be free? Is what happens is that I think these superstructural apparatuses, exigencies that kind of disclose what action should look like work together to kind of not only mold students into this kind of liberal subject, but also keeping them away from doing the stuff we were talking about, what you were just saying just now, right? Talking about the stuff that is real philosophy, right? Where we're like, wait a minute, what is a student, right? Like, is a student just someone who reads a bunch of stuff, um, is studying all the time and like gets no sleep? Or is a student like this vessel almost, right? Like this vessel for knowledge can then use the knowledge to kind of like do all kinds of stuff in the world, right? Like, you know, we don't ever get that kind of what is a student questioning because 
we're so much involved with the superstructure and the exigencies and the planes of action that kind of organize experience for us. And it's a, absolutely, it's a very, um, it's a very, very invasive way. Cause I mean, I think there are all kinds of things that kind of end up reinforcing it, right? Like obviously there is the classroom itself, but then like, you know, you get home and then you sit down and you're like, am I actually being productive? Like, am I, am I being a productive yeah. student? Yeah. Yeah. Like, and all that stuff distracts you from kind of like taking up the real philosophical challenges. Yeah. It's, it's, it's sinister, but it's also like, it's also working so much in the background that you don't really even notice it. A good teacher allows you to subvert the academy while still doing philosophy in the academy. Yeah, I, I, I 100% agree. Yeah. So University of Leeds went on strike for the same reason that um, Adams University did, which were these pretty severe cuts to pensions, uh, jobs and departments and so on. I think most of the students understood why that was happening and how also these cuts would actually affect their own education as well. So actually that there was a sort of common interest um, in the preservation of, of you know, good teaching standards at the university and so on. Um, there was the sort of sort of infamous, infamous tweet about how, by the student union, about how uh, these strikes would affect the most sort of marginalized members of our community and therefore we cannot support a strike and encourage, you know, the, the staff to negotiate again with the university, all this scab stuff, basically. But one of the interesting things about strike action, and I know a lot of UK universities have done this, and I think it's common in America too, is to turn that strike into a moment of, of common ground, I think, between students, between uh, teachers and, and students, right? And to find uh, new ways of putting their own practices, their own sort of disciplines into practice in that moment. Sort of teach outs of the, of the idea, right? Is sort of, so people from like sociology, for example, just top my head, right? Um, might hold some sort of sort of informal discussions or something to talk about how sociology can help us understand, you know, um, what, what, how, the, you know, the, the reasons why we're on strike in the first place and what, it, you know, what the broader forces at work here are. Um, and that's, that's one of the really, really um, powerful things that I think those sorts of strikes that universities can do. So I've, I've seen some of them and, um, you know, you, you get um, students who, you know, many of whom would, would be very um, un, uninvolved even, you know, uninterested sometimes in the, in the sub subjects they're studying in the way that it's taught, but you put them in this new context where that sort of relationship of hierarchy is now sort of flattened out. Um, and we can see why it's important, you know, they can see what's going on there. Um, so that's one of the things I've, I've, I've enjoyed seeing with, the, with these uh, sort of university strikes. Yeah, horizontal leadership is, um, I think, really, really good. I think um, one of the things that I do like about my university, it is a it is a Catholic institution, but, you know, they are um, they Christian brothers and the Christian brothers run things um, a little differently than like other institutions do. And one of the things that they prioritize is this kind of like horizontal leadership where like you are, and that's part of the reason why it's the, a brother instead of like father X, Y, or Z. It's, it's an attempt to kind of like place the situation where like everyone's kind of like on equal ground. Obviously, you know, there are instances where it doesn't work out that way. Um, and not, not even less to do with like the Catholic institutions, just like broader forces going on within it. Um, but I think that that model being kind of somewhat baked into the school is a good thing for students to kind of see like at work. So when things like that happen, like when strikes happen, if they happen, we can have a good playing around on how things go. So Tyreek, I don't think we got a lot of clarity yet about what it is you intend to study as a graduate student. And I'm curious as to whether you will be taking the track of doing an MA program first, or are you trying to jump right into a PhD program and maybe just give us some of the details? Yeah, about yeah, yeah. So currently I'm an undergrad, um, and I think I might have mentioned it before, but I go to a pretty pluralist school with pragmatists, philosophers, continental philosophers, and uh, analytic, like, and all in between. So I've, I've kind of liked that. And I think that's really good for students, you know, for students that might be listening. I think that one of the best experiences you can have, um, even if you're more inclined to one branch or one like you know side or camp more than the other, kind of being exposed to everything is helpful. It can help you choose easier. For me, I am looking primarily at like continental programs and I am more so attempting to kind of like jump from the MA stuff into the PhD. 
I'm all, I'm doing that for a few different reasons. One, uh, there are there are diff- there are ways to kind of like I know if I'm not mistaken, enter in a PhD program, and if you feel like leaving, you can leave with the MA. Um, for most programs, I think that's the case. Um, but also just that I know that uh, I have this. I kind of just want to take it to like as far as I can, and if I can just kind of like jump into it that way, then I'm perfectly fine doing it that way. Um, I know a lot of students take time off and whatnot. And that totally makes sense. Academic burnout is real. Don't let anyone tell you it isn't. <laughs> um, um, no matter what grade level you are, I don't even care if you're like in middle school, like it's totally real. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, I, I do plan to, uh, after undergrad to go into the PhD stuff. That's hopefully work that I'm trying to work on this summer uh, in terms of writing samples and whatnot. So. Yeah. Do you have a focus more or less specified or? Yeah. So I, so as the Twitter post might suggest, I am a big existentialist and some of the conversations we've talked about so far should suggest I'm a big existentialist. Um, I am interested in, I do want, I want to really do some stuff on existential phenomenology and Marxist political philosophy. Um, you know, and obviously the the big thing that a lot of people point to is like Sartre, Sartre's later work, um, like critique of dialectical reason, uh, search for a method, all that kind of stuff. Um, which you know, this, the critique is from everything I've heard from like professors a lot harder than being in nothingness, which I haven't even worked my way through yet. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't even worked my way through yet. Um, I have read Search for a Method, which uh, is digestible uh, and kind of easy to work through. So I'm not sure how I'm going to approach it. Um, you know, what's interesting is that there is a, there's a current development in phenomenology called uh, critical phenomenology, um, where a lot of people are working with phenomenological texts uh, like Ponty or Cyril and Heidegger and are looking at stuff um, that are uh, more political. Uh, you know, disabilities, a big one, I think. Um, disability being a big one. Um, race being another really big one. Uh, there's a lot of folks working uh, with Fanon as well, who I'm also really, really interested in. Um, so, but there's, from what, I've, from what I've been able to gather, it doesn't look like there are many folks um, doing anything with like Marx or anything or kind of trying to work around with that. Like, I'm interested particularly in looking at stuff like, um, you know, the phenomenological implications of alienation alienation, not just from work, but like from like labor itself, uh, from the products you produce, alienation from, you know, fellow, your fellow person, what that, you know, impl- like what the, what are like the kind of like uh, real lived experiences that are at work within that um, Marxist uh, category. Um, and then I'm also kind of thinking about like some of the, like the superstructure stuff that we were just talking about and uh, its relationship to exigency and whatnot. So, I have to find the, you know, texts and whatnot that can kind of help weave this super broad project together. But I, I'm kind of hoping that um, I'm able to put, put it together and make sense of it somehow. Yeah. Like there are, there are plenty of programs that are doing work in phenomenology and like theories of embodiment, you know, uh, the philosophy of the body and so on. And like critical phenomenology is like fundamental to that. Also like, um, I think the relationship between like CDR and and Fanon's work is kind of under evaluated in these spaces. So like that's an awesome uh, position to have. Uh, Critique of Dialectical Reason is a nightmare book <laughs> filled with new and abandoned, and then re and then picked up again in the second volume concepts. Um, if you were cool with search for a method you'll probably be okay with a lot of cdr um but you're right that it's like a fundamentally different book like uh hazel barnes when she was tapped to write the translation of the the introduction in the first chapter which is in in the anglophone world what we call search for a method Mm -hmm. uh in her intro she's like what do we do with this sartre (laughs) right because it's so fundamentally different from a lot of what we think we got in existentialism 
is a humanism and being mm-hmm. in nothingness. But I mean, Sartre maintains that there is like a continuity between, you know, bad faith and let's say like um, the field of the possible or the progressive regressive method. And like um, the fact that like Sartre studies has just essentially created like these different tombs that you can access of, you know, the, the dead philosopher Sartre it's kind of remarkable because like he is one guy yeah, you know? yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> and the, like you know speaking of someone whose like first philosophical interest before really focusing on Foucault was was briefly Jean-Paul Sartre uh I can say that like Foucault is treated in kind of a similar mm. way you know there's phenomenological psychological Foucault in the 50s oh and then there's the history of madness to archaeology of knowledge Foucault and then there's the penality Foucault and then there's the truth Foucault and then he's one and dude a <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> this is the first time on the Deleuze and Guattari predominantly oriented podcast that anyone has ever said that someone is just one guy <laughs> <laughs> no I like yes one one is multiple but that's part of the problem right is, is the desire to create kind of a clean depiction of a philosopher that says Actually, I don't want to communicate with the rest of this. I want to take one strand or one branch of thought and just and just drill down and do. And that sort of work can be fantastic, but it can also foreclose on all of these other socio political forces that contribute to the corpus. And in a certain sense, it's actually that that contributes to the drive for specialization that's so valuable to the neoliberal model of education, particularly in philosophy. It's not just that you can specialize in Foucault or specialize in Sartre. You need to specialize in specifically secondary literature on him or this particular text or period of his work, because that will let you stand out from the other CVs that pile up on admissions or hiring committees and so on. So like in a certain sense, like all of these things that that we say shouldn't communicate with each other do. And in a certain sense, our work reflects a lack of communication within the very theorists that we that we say we love and adore and want to understand. What do you put on your business card? Are you, are you, a, are you a Sartre scholar? Are you a Sartre and philosopher? <laughs> yeah. That's, it's a, the, the scholarly industrial complex versus... We, we went through this quite a bit on our episode on capitalism, philosophy as a capital form of thought. Are we going to be producing books upon books upon books? And that's the question of, you know, do we... Do we uh, steal from university in that sense. I mean, I, I, it's what I really like about you know, Moten and Hardy again. You, know, you have to sort of steal what you can from university if they provide it to you. Do, do a couple of books here. It'd be like Edmund Gettier. Edmund Gettier, he taught in every analytic philosophy class, wrote like two papers his entire life. That man was living <laughs> completely on the rage, just like just doing whatever philosophy he wanted to do and then did two papers, submitted his career as a scholar his entire life. That's, that's one of the things too that I think, like I, there are folks who I know who are, um, who want to do this stuff and kind of want like notoriety or, you know, not like, not like, like super huge name or notoriety, but like kind of want to be recognized in some ways. But part of it, for, for me, I mean, like I'm all right with just like publishing here and there, but like, I think for me, what I think is the real, like, um, like motivating force, um, or what I hope to be the kind of big motivating force is like the teaching. Like, cause I think that's the part where like, you have the potential because a lot of it is more so in your control. You have the potential to kind of like break down or subvert um, the kind of like, you know, neoliberal expectations that people have. Whereas like, you know, publisher parish is like a very, very new, you know, thing that has kind of made its way into the university. But like with the, with teaching, there are so many different ways that you can kind of like orient teaching to show students that like, learning can be a completely different experience than what you've been exposed to. Right. Like one of the cool things that I thought, um, one of the kind of like, uh, blessings in disguise, if you will, for like zoom learning was the ability to share your screen. Right. And then this probably sounds like really weird. Like, where am I going with this? But like the ability to share your screen, I think not just for the instructor, but for students allowed a lot of different things to happen in my classes. Right. So students were able to kind of like, um, particularly in my aesthetics course, right? We were able to like bring up stuff that we might've saw on the internet. Like here's this piece that we looked at um, and we, you know, we just got done reading um, Hegel's uh, stuff on, 
you know, aesthetics. We just got started reading the critique of pure judgment. Um, what can we, what can we say about this piece that we just, that I'm looking at right here? You can share your screen and like the, now the instructor is a student, right? All the other students are st students as well. And we're all kind of like contributing into this like conversation using the stuff we learned about on something that uh, one of us might have found. I think stuff like that, you know, in just teaching, like, and, and there are other examples, that you, there's other ways you can do this, obviously, in real life as well. But where you, the way you can kind of break down the power relations between teacher and, teacher and student in the classroom helps to show students different ways of kind of like, you know, organizing how they live, right? Just, just like at a, at a very, very fundamental level. And I think like if, when it comes to teaching and philosophy, it's so important to have good teachers yes. in yes. philosophy. Yes. And I think oftentimes the the emphasis placed on publishing can sometimes detract from the kind of engagement that we'd like to see from professors in the classroom. And I think that if you just look at the history of philosophy, right, and you look at the echoes of Hippolyte and Canguilhem and Foucault, right, like these were individuals who aren't necessarily like taking up massive amounts of bibliographic space in works like Discipline and Punish or History of Sexuality and so on, but their presence is there in the very nature of the writing itself, right? Mm -hmm. the, you know, Hippolyte is present in Deleuze's difference in repetition, not precisely as, you know, a, a per particular point of constant reference, but as a sort of force that propels a kind of mode of approach to these texts. And the same thing goes for Althusser and his students and so on. And these are also like, you know, fantastic, remarkable figures in the canon, but it's precisely their relationship with their students that made them the force retrospectively that they became for Althusser in particular, right? His work on the ideological state apparatus is published way later than one might think considering like when he was born and when figures like Deleuze, Foucault, and and so on, and Derrida were writing. It's super important that we have professors that that can talk about this stuff. But on the on the specialization thing, like I, I think that that one way to solve it is to just like force interaction. Um, like I remember I was writing for a for a conference on on Sartre, and I had like a small bit on no exit and. My co-author, who was uh, who's one of you know was was the figure in my undergrad years who who you know is the reason I do all of this stuff essentially was like yeah you know they're not going to really vibe with a with a lot of Sartre's theatrical work being here and like to me <laughs> the fact that I can't even put no exit in conversation with being a nothingness is like a <laughs> fundamental problem right like that's not. You know, that's not just a pedagogical preference or like something for like, no, that that, that forecloses on a philosophical discourse that could manifest. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I mean, it's like if you read nausea, like a different work. But I mean, if you read nausea, it's like when I read that originally, you can just feel like this guy's itching to write a big philosophical text. Like just reading it is like like and even some of the people who like talk about it, like one of the things that. Uh, you'll run into like at least one of my professors says like when you read nausea you're like why didn't this guy just do start writing philosophy already <laughs> you know and, and, and I think it makes perfect sense right like you want these things to be in conversation with each other it makes I, I don't think it really makes sense it's just to kind of like even even and even when you know with Marx right like I, I'm I'm one of the folks who you know might get uh, attacked for this one but I'm one of the folks who are not big on the epistemological break I think, you know, we should put early Marx and late Marx in conversation with each other. Um, you know, there is, I think when we do that, like you said, like we're cutting off a lot of uh, important stuff that could come out when we do that. Um, or like we just have to, un like maybe the question is like understanding yeah, the brain yeah. and not just assuming it from the front end and then just saying these are distinct, <laughs> these are distinct discourses. No, like there's a real like fundamental difference between capital and the 1844 manuscripts. And we have to understand why. And if we don't understand why, then we're terrible Marx scholars. Yeah, but I've got a paper to you in three weeks, damn it, Will. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like it's not, you know, I think people see that and like they kind of see a departure from ideas and it's like, okay, well, 
clearly this scholar is no longer interested. And I, I feel like that's not really the case. I mean, we're human beings at the end of the day. We get interested in all kinds of stuff at random points in our lives. I don't think that, that means that like stuff that we might not be giving as much attention to is any less important. Um, at least that's that's how I kind of see it, uh, think about it. All right. Well, Tyreek, we're almost at the hour here. You were an excellent guest. You delivered the goods. You said everything that I think needed to be said on this episode today. And we we kind of aired out the collective grievances of us <laughs> students. <The> war stories. <laughs> but before we go, I, I think the question that will take us out is this. As, as an existentialist, as a Sartrean, I think Sartre has a quote. It's something about it's difficult to free fools from the chains that they revere. I don't know if... Sounds familiar. But if we were to write a guide, an existentialist guide to Twitter, what would be the guiding premise or maxim? Is it difficult to free the fools from the chains that they revere? <laughs> um, hmm. If I had to say... And, and the reason I ask is this, is because you you are a top-tier Twitter performer in terms of your positivity level and not getting caught in the dialectic of whatever the dialectic of the day is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess I, guess I can say the same thing. He says, like, um, when talking about, like, anguish, which is one of my favorite, uh, like, Sartrean um, ideas is that, you know, when you get on Twitter, you know, and you see like a discourse happening, do not let the discourse organize how you will be tweeting for the day. Okay. <laughs> let yourself be open to the anguish of possibilities. Um, you know, there are all kinds of things to tweet about. Tweet about it. Do not let the discourse control you. <laughs> Thank you.